Welcome to the Psychovetical Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Kirkpatrick. Uh, another, another, another week kind of comes to an end. Like every every day seems to just be exactly the same as the as the day before at the moment. Um, thanks for thanks to anybody who came and listened to my uh, talk this week on Wednesday on on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the sound was better this time. I have to use the, the microphone on my computer. Uh, unfortunately, I only had like mono sound, so it's only in one person's, only in one ear. So yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's quite a steep learning curve. This uh, OBS, OBS kind of software kind of thing. So I'll probably I'll probably do another one on Wednesday. But I might do one that's was a bit too like a bit too much swearing apparently in the other one. So I might I might try and do one a bit more family friendly. I might do one about uh, going across Greenland maybe, which has got lots of funny stories. Although there's the, uh, the only thing I'm worried about for being family friendly, I persuaded the two women on the trip to go on the pill so they wouldn't have periods, and uh, didn't work out. So. Uh, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's family friendly, but you know I suppose you can fuck it, say what you want, can't you? So so that'll be on Wednesday at eight o'clock. I, I, I'm I'm finding it less stressful because someone someone complained about the the one I did about going to Denali uh, that it was crap and I should stick to writing books, uh, which is always good to get like positive, you know, good good feedback. Um, and uh, so I, so I, I had this idea I was going to put a lot more effort in. To the next one I did, but then I just couldn't be asked to do that. So I just, you know, so I think it's, I got so much, I got so much, so much on at the moment that it's, uh, it's, you know, you just, you just haven't got time to, to do things, uh, do things well. They just have to be the way, the way they are really. Uh, oh, speaking of busy, like my, I'm finally, I, I know I've been saying this about a year, but I really feel like I'm kind of getting to the end of the, of the down book. Uh, although today I was talking to uh, Paul Tassel, who lives up in Gairlock in Scotland, who's like a great, great climber, and my, he was my best man when I got married. Uh, he's a a, two, a cool guy, uh, does a lot of guiding on Sky and uh, stuff like that, super fit guy. But he, I was telling him about the book, how the idea of the book is, you know, you're distilling all this information, and you're trying to make it, sim- you're trying to simplify it so people can have one source of information like people can people can, people can argue whether whether it's the right information but it's just all in one place so instead of saying like a simple things like tying ropes together for abseiling you know it's, it's not an e- it is an easy answer but it doesn't seem that easy if you go looking on the internet so so he was like oh so you're basically re- writing a book that's that's simplifying everything but it's like 400 400 pages long i'm like yeah i guess i am so I said the idea that what I should do is in the chapter that like the chapter the the book's kind of broken down into uh, like man powered person powered uh, descent like just general ideas about how to get down off mountains and how to get out of the wilderness or whatever so that's like a chapter and then there's uh, chapters about chapters about general safety chapters about communication uh, in relation to abseiling but also it's, a, it's it's kind of it's got a broader thing like I've, i'm trying to i'm I've, I've noticed on my travels that there isn't really that good a uh, a method of people identifying that they're at the top of the pitch and they want to get lowered off if you're sport climbing and i've seen a hell of a lot of like near-death experiences from people who have this really kind of casual like okay you can lower me down or okay you know, I'm there, or, or you know, the, and and you get people where people get taken off belay because they think they're, you know, they think they're seconding someone up, but actually they're lowering someone down. I know someone got killed where someone couldn't tell, you know, someone could see that someone was being taken off belay, and all, all there's like a sh- lots of stuff where we don't really have a really sort of formal thing. So so in the book, instead of saying like, um, okay, lower me down, you know, that's it basically is i've I've gone for this uh, very formalized uh like um belay ready belay ready you know belay ready you know so you're like you say you you know it's communication and like it's signal and response and this kind of stuff so so yeah so I, i'm sure people will really not not think that's a great idea or like it's just bullshit but i think uh i think the problem with with a lot of that kind of climbing i think climbing is very cool people like to be really nonchalant like i'm i've just been writing the bit about when you throw your ropes down 
uh, when you cast your ropes down off off the top of a on an abseil. Now, if you're the one who's like, right, right, let's separate the two ropes. I want to, I want to like snake the two ropes out so they're all laid out, ready hanked, and I'm going to do this special little coil rescue coil alpine bomb coil and I'm going to like chuck them off one at a time you know it's like it's very thorough and it's very like abseil nazi and it's like the best way to do it but who wants to you know it's a bit uncool like just get all your ropes just grab them and just chuck them over the edge and just let them all tangle up and get caught and everything like that's a much more cool way of doing it so I think I think climbers in general uh, you don't get this in like probably you don't get this in like base jumping or cave diving is there a bit they're like I'm a bit too cool for that a bit too cool to say be lay on, be lay on. You know, it's like, oh God, it's a bit like, you know, climb when ready. You know, like it's a bit too, you know, a bit too instructor type person. Someone who's like, has loads of screw gates, that kind of thing. So, uh, so, 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 so I've been trying to, uh, I mean, trying to, um, trying to, trying to sort of think of some different ways of doing it. So like bringing in some techniques and how people do things in like the res- rescue kind of area, rope access, canyoneering, uh, some other some other kind of things and trying to trying to have like this like you this kind of uniform um is it uniform you know um sort of uniform theory of uh, uh um combined theory of of descending off mountains and uh, so so the book also includes like lowering uh escaping from escaping i wasn't going to have belay devices but i've actually put it in there now you know how to lower someone on a on a plaquette and all that kind of stuff. So, but I had this idea that what I should do, I should just condense, just have one chapter, like literally one page in the book where I just take all the information because really it's really, really, really simple. Just take all that information, just condense it down to one page. Like this is the knot to use. This is the knot to use on the end of your rope. This is the device to use. This is the prusik you should use. You know, this is how you should throw your ropes down. This is how you should pull your ropes, blah, blah, blah. And just like truly... You know, really bring it, really bring it down to like the absolute, you know, basics. You could have it on a, you could just have it on a, on a credit card. You know, have a little tiny thing in your wallet. We're like, this is the, the default, you know, technique. And then, and then it's, uh, and then, but then by by knowing all the other stuff, like there's like a huge section like advanced, advanced abseiling, which includes like loads of crazy shit that no one's ever seen before, like. Some crazy, some crazy stuff, and uh, there's a whole bit about problem solving, which has got loads of crazy stuff about how to, you know, how to repel on like how to do a retrievable repel on like four ropes, and loads of loads of weird stuff, like how to do a sixty meter abseil with one rope that's retrievable that doesn't include like a fifi hook and things, um, and and those things maybe you'd maybe you'd never have to do it in the whole of your life, you know, maybe you'd never have to use any of those techniques. Uh, but knowing them, it's, uh, it's, well, I guess know, knowing them, I think I've mentioned, mentioned on this podcast when I was like, when I was in climbing in Kenya, uh, I was with someone who broke his leg and we had to like abseil off a route and he had a broken leg and, uh, you, you know, like you, you kind of learn all this stuff, but it's, it, you know, when you have to put it into practice, often it all kind of goes, goes out of your head, uh, like a really, a really good thing. To remember is there's a big difference between uh, panic and speed, uh, <laughs> uh, which is uh, you know kind of very very common. Like I've had a few experiences with when I've been with people who were like super experienced and super knowledgeable, but when things went wrong, they were like totally useless. They just you know they just they just they knew what they knew it all and they were qualified in it, but when it came down to it, they just they they weren't able to apply that kind of information. Where sometimes when someone doesn't have any of that, any of that information they'll just immediately uh you know like uh you know pull it together like sort of work things out and uh, and come up with a solution there's a really a really good book to read is a book called uh, stress effect which is all about how people like it begins with uh your man um hitting the flock of birds and having to land the plane in the in the hudson and it, you know it goes into a lots of, lots of very it's a very detailed kind of book about you know how how we uh, problem solve and cognitive ability and everything else, but it's quite it's very it's very interesting. But it's but it seems to be that uh, there's all these models of how people make decision making, how they come to a conclu- conclusion, and they're very sort of formalized. But it turned out that when they actually tested people who were in you know in really stressful situations, like you know business people, soldiers, whatever, that they 
they were able to um, they made they made the decision almost immediately, and then they would have to try and co- work, come to a co- work out how they were going to do it. You know, the, so they, so something would happen, and then they uh, they would almost immediately know what they were going to do, and then they would have to somehow come away, come round to working out how they're going to do it and persuade everybody else. So you know, you'd have this really formalized way of coming to a to a decision, but really the person who was like the dominant force had already decided what to be what was to be done um, immediately. So it's uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. So um, yeah, so the book so the book I really I'm, I'm really I really feel like I'm you know I really feel like I'm I'm getting getting to the end of it now. But it's all it's always always all the little tiny you know when the, when. When your man painted the Sistine Chapel, I bet it was like, oh, you need to, you know, you need even if you've got to paint the feathers on on the angels' wings or something, there'd be there'd be one little thing that that I've, you know, it'd be like a little detail I've, that'll take ages. Like all the all the diagrams are all uh, numbered, and then they're all numbered in the description, and some of the descriptions are like very very technical and very long. So I, all of them at the moment have no numbers on, so I have to go back through. And uh, and put all those in, and um, so yeah, it'll be, it'll be. But hopefully, 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 it'll be soon. I don't know if anyone can even get books at the moment. Um, the book, the book is inter- It's interesting. The book is is um, is basically the only way to make it commercially viable for me to do a book like this. It, like I couldn't, I could never do it with a publisher because it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work out financially. So I have to so I do it through uh, print on demand through Amazon. So Amazon print the book. So I you know so I write the book, uh, illustrate the book, design the book, and then it, so it means I get um, you know all I have to like divide the profit up between lots of different people. It's not it's not that like publishers rip you off. It's just that there isn't, just isn't enough money in in publishing for anyone to really, really make any money out of it. They have to just sell shit loads of like ch- cheap books to make a living. And really books. You know, books should cost. You know, should cost you like a hundred quid. You know, like a good book should. Uh, someone spent a lot of time writing, like a good, like a technical book, should really cost you the same as a book you'd buy, like at university, like a or like a law book or something. Probably, probably more than a law book because a lot. You know, it's a there's a huge amount of work that goes into it. But but unfortunately, unfortunately for the the book writing people, it's you know a book is almost the same price as it was. Uh, you know, like twenty years ago, thirty years ago, uh, like a, you know, you can buy a a paperback for like five quid or whatever. Um, so yeah, so ho- hopefully the a bit the same as the same can be said about ropes and uh, rock boots and things like the the price the price has been very you know does, often doesn't represent the amount of like specialized knowledge or you know stuff that goes into that kind of thing. Where if you're making fleeces or you you know if you're North Face. You know, got a lot of you know it's good, but um, but I get quite a lot of criticism about having of selling books through Amazon. Like, um, people are like Amazon's like the devil and and all that kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with that. But um, but I can understand why people think that. But Amazon sell eighty percent of all the books sold in the world. So uh, for me, I I always think you should just kind of exploit the fuck out of people, <laughs> out of things, out of technology. You just cannot be that person who. You know the, the guy who owns a typewriter repair shop, who was wondering what happened to all his business. You know, you just have to, um, you know, work work with these things. Uh, you know, that one one once upon a time, there was millions and millions and millions of women who were working as typists. Like you know, probably the the number one, you know, kind of semi professional job for women. And there's there's no there's no women doing that anymore. You know, those those women are doing other things, and so that's. You know, it's a the the whole tax thing is, uh, you know, tax is an interesting subject. Having just lived in a country where no one pays any tax, um, it's uh, it made me it made me, you know, the how how dynamic and how there was no very little poverty uh, made me made me question the whole tax thing. But that's a the tax thing is a very difficult thing to even. It's one of those. It's one of those big big to- big topics that we don't talk about. Uh, especially not in especially not in England, but it's a it's a very it's very interesting it's a very interesting topic. So, um, <laughs> speaking of controversial issues, I know I don't like to speak about the thing that is currently happening, but I had a few interesting experiences this week. Uh, where where we where I live here in Galway at the moment, there's 
we live next to a river and it's actually on like university campus for some reason like uh vanessa's mum mum and dad like on well vanessa vanessa's mum is like quite interesting that when she was a child she was given away to another pet to another family to another to a couple didn't have any children with and someone else give another child to this couple so this was before adoption or every, anything else it's a very irish kind of story and so she grew up in this in this house all her life and and now she's like 75 so you know for 75 years she's been well 70 years she was given away when she was like quite little you know she's been living in this house and and as she's been while she's been living here like the the university of Galway has kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger and kind of gone all the way around it the whole of her house is like basically in the university campus it's kind of really really weird um uh, what's that what's that really good what's that film um and uh there's that science fiction film from like the black and the black and white one um anyway it's a uh, it's kind of it's kind of weird but um but where we are like you can you can like walk along the river it's quite a nice little walk it's like 5k so I was I've been running it but then I was getting a bit of shin I've getting shin, shin splints because I've got really crap uh, trainers that are probably more for like doing weights and going for running but you can go for this like 5k like walk along the river and back and part of it's you know part of it's owned by the university so the university decided that they would put these metal barriers up to stop people walking along one little tiny section of it like you can just there's no way you could barrier off the whole area but they just put this one area this barrier and actually put five barriers one in front of the other and all tie them all together with rope so what people did like you know this is like you know pe- people have, can only go out for two kilometers outside their house like, this is the most perfect place to walk it's outside it's by the river it's just perfect so everyone has been going out and, and climbing over this wall you know it's like the wall's not very high it's just next to the barrier so it's like ridiculous it's like you know, you get to the barrier, you walk five feet to the side, climb over a wall and go around it. And people have been doing this for like seven or eight weeks. Now the wall is getting totally trashed, but also like you're, you're, you're funneling everyone into this one little bit of wall where everyone's climbing over it. You know, like if, you know, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I don't actually think this thing is actually transmitted that much by people touching things. I think it's mainly by people being ill and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, but this, you know, we we can't, we're not allowed to think that because it's because then we might question whether the whole mask thing that oh, maybe masks are a good idea anyway. But that's another that's another topic. So so everyone has been funneled into this area, and it's I think I said on this podcast like a long long time ago that this coronavirus thing would be come down to sort of uh, institutional cowardice, and in a way, it's kind of a good example of uh, there's someone in the security office who can see all these people doing this and he's like got nothing look i'm just doing my job i'm just doing my job you know this is my job you know we've got you know i've done my job you know it doesn't matter that we're making things worse i've done my job so the other day a woman fell off the wall climbing over it and she was like she'd hurt herself and vanessa kind of came across her and everyone was just kind of climbing over her and um so she came back to here and she's like oh we need to give us you know she was like get some chocolate and a cup of tea with some sugar in it or something so we have to call the ambulance so we, so we went back over there and I was like, oh, this is fucking stupid. Like, let's, like, everyone was climbing over this poor woman. So I was like, fucking hell, let's just get, let's untie this stupid, this stupid, these fe- this fence. So we started untying all these barriers with these bits of rope on and we pulled them all apart. And then people were kind of coming on either side of us. And I was like, I was like, freedom. And, you know, like, you know, all this kind of like making a joke of it. And people were like really freaked out. And then he was like, I opened, we opened it and we're like, look, just go through there. Cause like there's a woman down there and she's like hurt herself and the ambulance is coming. And, and some people wouldn't walk through it. It was like, do you know when you see the experiments where it's like, oh, this is some kind of trap, you know, like what's, what's, you know, what, there was something there. Now there isn't, is this like, a, am I, am I going to get into trouble or, and it was like really interesting um, experiment, you know, on human beings and uh, you know, how, how, I don't know. I find it like really, I find it kind of really, really interesting. But then the other thing I saw the other day, which was, uh, int- was we went down to the 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 harbour here in Galway. It was like really, really beautiful. <clears throat> it was like a romantic night out. We just we had a we had a pizza, and we went and had this, sat on the sat on the on the grass and had this pizza near the harbour. And everyone was spread. You know, there was like people around, but people were spread out by quite a long margin. You know, people were maybe like. 
200 meters apart, you know, all over, you know, it's just scattered around this kind of harbor kind of area. It wasn't like super busy. And there was a couple sitting and they were obviously like drinking some beer or something. And here, like a policeman in Ireland is called a guard. And we saw this guard like coming along and, you know, people were just sitting down. Some people had like a guitar, like there was like three people sat together and, you know, she was coming along and every, every group, she'd stand there for like five minutes talking to them. And then they would have to get up and then they would leave, you know, like, oh, you're not allowed to, you know, enjoy yourself. You're not allowed to sit here. And so, you know, I don't want to repeat this. We're hearing this all the time, but they came along to this poor couple. And the next thing, the, the guard like picks up the person's beer and starts pouring it into the, into the sea. <laughs> And because um, you're not allowed to drink out outdoors, out outside in Galway. And what I thought was funny, it was like the, you know, like everyone, we're always told like the, about the new normal. But what we don't know is the old normal is still in force. So it's uh, uh, it kind of, uh, it's kind of, yeah, very, very interesting. So, um, but back to that, back to the, the real, the real McCoy. So here, so this, e- this evening, this today, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go through some questions. I've had some, uh, I've had a lot of questions. So I had some questions this week, uh, emails and I had some, I've had some, got some old ones here and some questions on from my YouTube channel. Now I, I am, I'm, I'm intending to, to end up doing some more, some proper stuff on YouTube, uh, some like technical, technical stuff, but I'm just uh, getting, you know, just getting, <laughs> getting around getting around to it so i'm i am i'm gonna get around to it so uh, anyway so a few a few questions for this uh this podcast uh, some so some of these are a bit blind so i'll just read them see what it says have you ever had to solo rescue a partner from a crevasse um i guess it's i guess it depends what how you define rescue like i guess it, i guess if you weren't there they would have fallen all the way in and died um so that's probably i've never had to i don't don't seem to remember i don't think i've ever had to set up a whole system or anything like that and i don't think many people ever ever really do set up a whole system it's like probably one of these things that you you practice uh you know you practice but in reality it's probably um not not very common to have to rescue somebody and it's probably more about uh it's probably more about avoiding falling in, into crevasses. It's probably more important, especially if there's just if there's two of you. Like I've fallen, I've fallen into crevasses like plenty of times, but I've never fallen like right into a crevasse. And and generally, those kind of crevasses where they're you know like you see in the films, they you can generally kind of you can generally spot those. I guess I've been done a lot of stuff where I had uh, the places where there was really massive crevasses. I've generally always had skis on like when I was in uh you know like in sort of you know a lot of you know places where you get a lot of crevasses it's uh, like Alaska and places um some some of the worst crevasses you can get are actually the these really really small ones where you can just like f- kind of fall in and break your leg or something I often find they're they're more kind of uh um kind of worrying um uh so yeah I think, I think a lot of it is like having good having good sort of r- skills between yeah, the two of you. Uh, like on on, if anybody watches my talk, oh no, I can't, you can't watch it because it's not on. It's not on not online. But you know, my talk I did a, a few, like two weeks ago about going to Denali. Uh, like I don't, I don't think we really did much crevasse stuff before we went. Uh, but you know, like Vanessa knows how to like you know climb a rope and all that kind of stuff, and she would have worked it all out. But like a lot of things, when 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 you fall in a crevasse, uh, a lot of things aren't like ideal. Now I, I, I once wrote I wrote an article on my blog. I think it's called "Doing a Bieber," uh, because there's some some really good footage of Justin Bieber where he was like uh, dancing on the stage and he suddenly like stepped off the stage or fell down a, a hole in the stage. You know, one minute he's there, the next minute he's like da- down this hole, and that is the that is the problem with with crevasses is is they're not, you know, they're not how you, they're not like in a film, you know, it's like, oh God, I'm going in. And like the the, the thing starts cr- crumbling and you start falling, you know, falling down into them. And uh, it's not, it's never quite how you think it's going to be. Um, uh, so the, often it's about, you know, trying to avoid, you know, you know, a gen- well, I guess it's one of these things that like when you work in a shop, you always think you can tell what, who the shoplifters are. Because they always look really, really dodgy. They're all they're all kind of like heroin addicts. But 
that's because you can spot those ones. You know, it's the ones who look like a doctor. You never, you never see those. So, you know, it's probably the crevasse you end up falling into could be, you know, so it's probably going to be the one where you didn't think there was a crevasse there and uh, just, um, you know, it just, just got you. So, but it's always really good to, it's always really good to establish, you know, good, good sort of, um, uh, what's it called? It, um, uh, uh, th- uh, you know, good operating, standard operating procedure on anywhere where there's crevasses and, and t- take them seriously because they're, uh, you know, I know I know somebody in the they were right near the end of a cravat, right at the end of a glacier, and they thought they were in a safe area. And I think they stopped for something, and then they were they were together, and the guy, the guy just started walking away, and he went straight down a crevasse, and he like had like a compound fracture. It was like blood everywhere, and it was like you know really it wasn't it wasn't very nice. Um, so yeah, until until you know until you can see like rocks, you know proper rocks around, or you definitely know you're off the glacier then. Then always always take it like super super seriously, and the the article I wrote the doing the Bieber was was basically if you're going to do any crevasse rescue then you should always make it like as difficult as possible, uh, like try and do it wearing, you know start start hanging on a rope with a rucksack on and with your mitts on and uh, you know trying to get your your prussic loops off the back of a your harness when you've got a big rucksack on and you've got all your your layers on you know it can be really really hard so you know that's where you think well maybe i should just put my prostate loops on before you know or, you know so you learn you learn a lot of skills by again like that that thing about you know the unex the things you don't think about so i often have this story that someone told me he was in the sas and the special forces and they're in this thing like the killing house where they have this house all made out of rubber tires or something and they you know they practice they're practicing for uh, entering rooms and they, you know they, i think they probably invented the whole going into rooms and killing people kind of business and they you know the the that kind of training it's it's like layers and layers and layers of training like it's like layered over you know maybe from the 1960s uh, and all the information that that people learn like in the um like the the uh uh, Munich kind of Olympics and was it Munich, yeah, Munich, like you know, all all these kind of terrorist things, and so so all this information, all this stuff you're being taught how to do, it's all layered over decades, you know. So you're you're not you're not you're not really you're just being told what to do, and you're following this standard operates procedure of like going into a room at this angle and and all this kind of stuff. And he, he had this story where they were all like lined up about to you know, like blow the hinges off this door or, or you know, hit with a sledgehammer or something. Then suddenly there was like a little gust of wind and the door just like blew open it by itself, started opening by itself. And he said like there was nothing, they would never taught what to do if a door opened by itself with a bit of wind and no one knew what to do. Like for a second, like everyone froze because their brains were like trying to like flick through the instruction manual for this situation. But uh, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. So I think. I think in the end they just like all charged through the door and shut everything. So um, so what's that got to do with crevasses? Um, I don't really know, but it's a good, it's an interesting story. So, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. So make it make life difficult. That's that's the that's the that's the thing. And uh, unexpected, expect the unexpected, and take it take it seriously. So another question. I uh, got a few questions here. Um. Why did climbers in the 1800s up until the 1970s, uh, I saw quite a few in the 80s too, insist on wearing knee-length trousers with long socks pulled up to their knees? I have been racking my brains for a functional explanation. I don't think it's for providing knee mobility because the trousers came down to just below the knee. Why not wear trousers all the way down or woolly tights all the way up? Never saw Joe Brown dressed like that though. Uh, yeah, Joe Brown. A lot of those guys used to wear um, sort of paratrooper trousers, or you know, like these sort of denizen, denizen trousers, like from the Second World War, which were uh, very baggy, um, baggy kind of canvassy trousers. They're probably had probably ahead of the time, really. They're probably if if you if you wore something like that now, you'd probably be quite cool. So uh, you bag, you know, so it's very heavy duty, um, very heavy duty sort of trousers. So the, I, I did have some breach. I did have some breaches. Uh, breaches they were called, weren't they? Breaches. And uh, Johnny Dawes still wears them. Uh, Johnny Dawes. He has these like corduroy ones that he wears. And 
I do actually remember. The thing, the thing about clothing, what we don't remember is a lot of clothing in the past wasn't elasticated. So you'd have people who had like woolen uh, swimming trunks. So as soon as they went in the water, the trunks would just end up being super heavy and like 10 times bigger than they were before and they would just fall down. So that's why like people would wear like a bathing suit. So they had like, you know, made out of wool. So they were, you know, they were actually like a, you know, like a leotard, like men and women. Um, I think things like, you know, like elast- elasticated, um, sorry, elasticated, uh, let's turn my thing off. Um, uh, elasticated sort of waist, waistbands and things are probably quite a, a late invention. And, and I think Lycra, uh, like, you know, Lycra in, in clothing probably, I guess that was probably only coming in like probably at the end of the end of the seventies, maybe. Um, so I know, I know like people like Rowan, uh, Rowan like super striders and um, these kind of shawler kind of fabrics, which were like stretch, stretch woven fabrics, were like really high tech at one time. And it's amazing they're still, you know, like Patagonia guy trousers and that kind of stuff. They're still. You know they feel kind of state of the art now, even though they're actually from like the nineteen the nineteen seventies, really. So I, I would maybe uh, I don't know maybe it's, like you could say it's more functional. Like I had a pair of like Gore-Tex trousers once, and they were actually breeches, so they only went down to your knees. So but if you're wearing like full length gaiters, you know you don't really need all that. You don't need all that extra like two layers of Gore-Tex uh, or two layers of gaiter. It's just kind of pointless. So as long as you're wearing gaiters and you have your over trousers on the outside of the gaiters, so the water doesn't flow down in through your gaiters, it was that it's actually a kind of a better system in a way. And you do they did actually feel, you know, if it was hot, if it was hot, you could just pull down, you could just take your socks off or, or roll your socks down. You know, if it was hot weather in your breeches, and so that was that was kind of good. Um, they just, they just, they just didn't have those the you know lightweight like poly cotton you know polyester trousers like your you know like this like what they called um, you know like like you know I remember when when Rowan bags Rowan in like poly polyester are they poly cotton anyway the trousers kind of appeared and they were pretty wacky and so were like Ronald Traxters the idea of these kind of lycra. Um, were they polyester or nylon sort of tracks tracksuit bottoms um, but those those things are still like way better than almost a lot of the stuff you know they're probably way better than Patagonia trousers you know like crappy looking you know the, uh, uh, Ron Hill tracksters you know the light the lightweight ones were bloody good were bloody good and they still are really good you know it's just but we just get bored of stuff and we want something else we want something newer uh, but they were really, really, really practical and super tough. Last, last you forever. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say, you know, like uh, I think there's a question later on here about making your own gear. Uh, like I would, I would look into getting a pattern or or trying some out because you know, sh- you know, shorts are really good. But um, having something that's a bit longer than a pair of shorts that protect your knees, uh, not that you shouldn't use your knees when you're climbing, uh, is uh, you know, it's it's pretty, it's you know. It's pretty, uh, pretty good. Like, like in New Zealand, you know, the classic thing about New Zealanders was it only ever wore shorts. Uh, you know, it had to be really, really bad to wear to wear trousers. So I think maybe, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe that that kind of thing is a good is a good idea. Like the, the technical, um, you know, for technical technical kind of stuff. Uh, so um, so yeah so. <laughs> So fit, fit, th- thumbs up for uh, breaches. Now there's another. Uh, he, he had, I had a few questions here which are all in the same vein. So climbing wet rock in Joe Brown's book, it seems that he went climbing every weekend, regardless of whether the rock had snow or rain or whatever. Even climbing through waterfalls, he just describes rock climbing on idle slabs in the snow. The mind boggles. Similar episodes on the Troll Wall book. I just finished reading. Um, like I think, I think climbing in wet weather, climbing on you know, out of out of condition kind of rock is really really good training, and I think that's how a lot of those climbers in the past, you know, you you Doug Scotts and those those kind of people, you know, they went out they went out no matter how bad the weather was, and they'd and they'd either go like hill walking, 
you know, hill walking with some scrambling, uh, uh, or just going out rock climbing. And it's really, it's really good training because, especially if you're doing it in big boots and things, because you you get a very good uh, understanding of uh, like your f- foot placements, which which are really important when you come to dry tooling and uh, mixed climbing, like n- knowing. Because like a rock boot, you can sort of put a rock boot on a net on a hold, and you can sort of smear it around and move your move your foot around. But when you're climbing in uh, leather boots or plastic boots or whatever, you have to kind of <coughs> you have to like hold your foot in a certain angle, and you can't really move it around. You know, you can't lift your heel up or whatever; otherwise, it'll like pop off. So that's um, that, that's you know, and and also you can often you can, you can almost stand on things which are smaller. Not not really, but you you know you can smart you can stand on some really really small holes in a pair of like you know solid boots that maybe you couldn't stand on in the rain in your in your rock boots. I don't know that maybe that's why. Um, and uh, the classic thing was people used to put um, socks on their you know rock, uh, socks on over their uh, rock boots um, to make them more grippy. But that was but in the in at, at that time. Uh, people's rock boots were just plimsolls, really. They weren't like proper um, sticky rubber, sticky rubber uh, boots. And uh, but like probably the most dangerous thing you can do when you're climbing, I always think, is when you top out on a crag and it's a bit damp and you've got your rock boots on and it's very grassy. <coughs> you know, you can like sl- easily like, s- slip off. Um, it's like ice. Um, so maybe having your having your socks on might be quite good. And the socks are very thick, so. Uh, so yeah, so I, I would really, I would really, I would really recommend uh, climbing in. You know, getting out there doing like what you know, like it was slabs or you know, do some like really big, easy, long route uh, in the you know in the rain or if it's snowy or whatever. And like often, if you're going to do sort of alpine climbing and that kind of stuff, you will often get in situations which are totally beyond the bounds of anything you've ever done before you've not like you know you might be good at you might be good at mixed climbing and you might be good at rock climbing but if you get in a situation where you have to rock climb in mixed climbing conditions as in you don't have any ice axes or crampons then having that experience of using of knowing how to do that is uh really really important uh you know like verglassed rock or you can you know, you, you, you know, I've had I've had situations where you're climbing and you they are, you've been using like your nut tool, <coughs> and you've been like scraping the you know scraping the ice off holes with your nut tool and you know climbing up and uh, so it's so it's you know so sometimes you just you're just bringing together all these different skills, but very few very few people train in that kind of I guess maybe it's like you call it a shoulder shoulder season climbing where it's not winter and it's not summer. But it's somewhere in between, like just knowing how to. I think in my book, there's a bit where I talk about going to climb the, um, trying to do the uh, ta- climb, trying to climb Tangerine Trip in a day, uh, and uh, take, took it took like three days, and we ended up in this in this big storm towards the end, and it was you know it was absolutely kind of hellish hellish kind of. Uh, conditions with like we had i don't know i didn't have any socks on for some reason and then any gloves and you were in this basically like mixed climbing with snow over slabs on the last last two or three pitches and you were literally like free climbing through this through waterfalls and through deep snow but without any gloves on and uh with no socks on and i had shorts on but i didn't have like gore-tex trousers on and uh there was some bits where i really don't think i would have ever got up the up, up the climbing without that without that kind of experience. Uh, and I was with um, like Matt Dickinson, who was like a really yeah, super, super good climber, super good winter climber, alpine climber. And there was like one bit where he couldn't, he couldn't do it. He couldn't climb up it. And he, maybe because he was like so cold. So I, so he came down and I did it and I ended up like, you know, but you, I, I just end, end up having to use a, cr- a cross between like throwing your rope up into the air and hoping it caught on something uh, and then pulling yourself up on it. And, just using some classic, you know, climbing uh, like grit stone with snow on it kind of techniques where you, uh, you know, you're just kind of using the, your whole body and getting into position and trying to relaxing that position then moving really carefully into another position. And so, yes, yeah, so I'd, re- I'd r- highly recommend uh, a bit of it. And it's good fun. You know, you just go out, do a few hours and then go to a cafe and have a have a nice cup of tea. So it's good. Um, 
So here, so guidebook suggests to add a grade or two to the climb if it's wet. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd probably start on something like really, really, really easy. Um, uh, da, da, da. So it's, uh, it's hard if you just it's hard if you're just setting if you're just starting climbing. Uh, but a lot of the a lot of the classic routes like uh, Great Gully on Craigerisfa in North Wales is like one of the premium epic North Face of the Eye, I guess, style, wet, horrible climbs you can do. I highly, highly recommend it. I remember once when I went outside, there was people who were climbing like E9 who couldn't get up it, who were coming back from Wales saying, we tried to climb Great Gully and we couldn't do it, it was too hard. So I would highly recommend you go and do something like that. And there's like Clacke Gully up in Scotland and there's loads of shit routes to do wherever you are. <laughs> um, and then last, well, last question was any... Any top tips how to keep going upwards when the weather turns to shit? Uh, kind of important self-rescue skill too. So I guess, yeah, just I'd say the same thing is just learn to, uh, you know, let, you know, learn to let, just learn by climbing in, in conditions which aren't uh, optimal, uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's cold. Like I've never had, I don't think I've ever had hot aches. So I, I've got like good, I've got very good circulation. So I'd, you know, that that makes a big difference if it's so cold that your hands you can't feel anything that's that that's uh pretty you know that's that's not good but sometimes you haven't got a choice you have to just climb up to the top you know like like classic routes like you know like the walker spare or these kind of alpine routes where you know it could be like rock climbing at the bottom and higher up it gets you know i guess you know much much sort of nastier really so uh new question um da, da, da. Enjoyed enjoyed my podcast. So I, I I did a yes I did this Denali podcast, a Denali uh, thing uh, talk, but I, I I took it down because it wasn't that good. Uh, it was it was all right, but it wasn't it wasn't good enough. And I've got to do I need to like if we ever get to go out again, I'm supposed to do it. I'm supposed to go on tour, and that's part of the tour, so it's been taken out anyway. This guy was saying thanks for that. Uh, I was looking back through your articles on the website and was thinking about trying to start making some of my own gear. Even though I'm still working, I have some free time available due to lockdown. I have a couple of questions though, as it's not something I've ever done before. What kind of sewing machine would I be looking for? What are essential, desirable features? Are there any basic and robust second-hand models for reasonable price that could be suitable for someone who has no previous experience? What would be a good first project that even for me would be difficult to fuck up completely? I have a copy of the 1979 Duke of Edinburgh design and make expedition equipment, if that helps. God, that sounds good. Apologies if you already answered that somewhere before. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, that's from Mike, who works in a hospital in Glasgow, I think. So, so the yeah, the sewing machine, like sewing machines are, 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 they're, yeah, sewing machines are like Breville sandwich makers or like those George Foreman grills. Like a lot of people, there's a lot of them, a lot of them around. Uh, for for a lot of for a lot of projects, sewing projects, you can really use any any sewing machine. As long, it's only when you start getting into some sort of heavy duty stuff, like uh, you know, like not you know, like Cordura and webbing and that kind of stuff, and it becomes it kind of wrecks it wrecks a sewing machine. You know, so you could you could you know go down to Argos or go down to Walmart and buy a you know quite a, the, the most cheap, basic cheapest sewing machine. And you could probably make, you know, you could make a bivy bag. You could make like a, a you know, like a, a, like a bothy bag. You could make, you could make stuff like that, and it would be, it would be fine. But it's when you when well, like when we went to Denali, we made our own uh, bags for our pulks, so we made, we made all sorts of stuff. And uh, in the past, I've made quite a lot of like sleeping bags, uh, like synthetic sleeping bags, uh, which are like really, really simple um, things to make. What else have I made? made? I've made like loads and loads of stuff. And I think before the sewing machine I had, it was a, it was a faff. Is it PAF? It's like a, a German, it's like a heavy duty German uh, sewing machine. And I'll, let's have a look on. I'll Google it. Um, it's P-A-S, PAF. Yeah, and I, and I just got it from, um, I just got it off, e- off uh, eBay. And it's, a, it's, it's P P F A F F. And it was like, you know, it had like a wooden base and it was, you know, kind of kind of heavy duty. And 
I can't remember. It didn't cost me like a huge amount of money because there's a lot of a lot of people replace old sewing machines. Uh, you know, like even a Singer sewing machine, like a manual sewing machine, will actually sew some pretty heavy duty. You know, cause, you know, that's what people used to make everything out of. Everything with was a, with a Singer sewing machine. You can often find those like almost like, like dirt cheap. You know, places. Uh, but it, but if you want like a good all round one, then um, then an old an old second hand one is good. Uh, but maybe I'd buy it from a sewing machine. Find a sewing machine shop where they mend sewing machines and get one from from someone like that because it's very easy for someone to sell you a, a sewing machine that's broken and you don't know until you get it. And there's a lot of um, you know te- the biggest thing for me was always like tension the tension you. you there's a lot of tension stuff involved with sewing machines. Uh, the current sewing machine I have is a Singer Heavy Duty sewing machine, which is the only sewing machine I ever bought, like brand new. And uh, I don't know how Heavy Duty. Let's have a look. Heavy Duty Singer. I'm googling it live. Singer Heavy Duty kettlebells. No, Singer Heavy Duty sewing machine. Uh, and I got it from got it from Argos. And they cost from Amazon. <laughs> from Amazon, oh, they're not available. You can't buy anything in out of Amazon these days. They've just sold out of everything. Um, in America, oh god, not available. Everything's not available. I don't like it. Oh my god, no, no. So you can buy all these like fancy sewing, mach- sewing machines that do all sorts of stuff that you don't really need. Uh, um, you know, they can do like for like real like hobby hobby type person, but. Most most people, um, so it's a, most people. But if you're doing like outdoor stuff, you really you only really need to do like a like a standard stitch kind of machine, uh, like bar. You can do like sort of bar tacking and stuff with with that kind of thing. I'm still trying to find the price of the bloody thing, Singer. Uh, yeah, that, now we don't buy anything from getting from China anymore. Every, no one's no one's got anything to sell. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. So Singer one's probably a little bit expensive. It's like a hundred and hundred and something. Uh, you can buy. You can basically buy various Singer sewing machines, but you can buy uh, a second-hand faff sewing machine uh, uh, off eBay. For, I think maybe mine costs like sixty quid or something. Um, and it's like an old one. It's an old sewing machine. Uh, but a good place to oh yes, yeah, so it's a two sixty. Mine was model two sixty. Um, a, a really good a really good place to start is get if go to Ray Jardine's website. Uh, Ray Jardine of the of the cam, the man who invented the cam, uh, the friend. Uh, if you go to his website, which is like railway dot com, I think, and look at some of his patterns. Like he sells patterns for sleeping bags and tarps and all kind of stuff and the, but there's a lot of it, really good information on there about sew machines about threads uh just like basic basic stuff i know he sells a a pattern a pattern and all the fabrics to build your own quilt and it's a, it's really good like i i built one i used it on the eye i uh, used it on the winter ascent of the nose um uh, like a two-person quilt and it's really it works really really well he, like he's used his He's climbed Mount Vincent, ski to the South Pole with it, and then all sorts of stuff with it. So, really, really, really good uh, introduction to to sewing stuff. And the the big thing for sewing, I think, is having enough space. You need a not a lot of space when you're sewing something big, uh, like a big table or something. And a lot of it's like in the preparation. You need some good scissors. Uh, a really good thing to really good thing I find are those metal sort of clips, uh, those black clips. What they're called? Not crocodile clips, but they're you know, they're black and you hold paper together with them. Paper clips? No. Anyway, they're those clip things. Uh, I find those really handy for like holding together and like heavy duty fabrics and things. And uh, like the more, the more you, the more you sew, you just have to, you just have to work through it. There's, it's kind of frustrating to begin with, but you can make, you know, things like stuff sacks are super easy to make. Um, you know, the more, the more you do it, the more you, you kind of get comfortable with it and you know, you know, you just kind of get your head around it, and and you're you're lucky because you've got so much information on the internet. You know, you got it's, you just teach yourself to blit, to sew anything. You know, it's just all out there. You know, a friend of mine, Travis, who lives out in Talkeetna in Alaska, like he basically built 
his own house just from watching YouTube. He had no 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 in, no formal training of how to do anything, you know, build a house, but he built a house out of watching YouTube. So, um, and like, yeah, so projects, uh, like a sleeping bag might seem like a big project, but it's not actually very, it's not that difficult. It's, you know, it's very, you know, it's not, it's not like, it's not like making a shirt or a pair of trousers or whatever. Uh, it's actually quite easy to make a sleeping bag. Um, like bivy bags are good things to make. Tarp is a good thing to make. Um, there's just like the more the more you start making stuff, the more you, you know, you start like modifying stuff and adding stuff, and uh, you re- you realize it's not actually that difficult to to make your own. Th- you make your own things. Uh, like I've been I've been I really want to make, try and make some. I've been, I've been really interested in. I had like a a waistcoat that I got from Russia, which is for like big wall climbing. That was that had uh, it was like a you know for, for attaching gear, but it was actually more like a waistcoat. It wasn't like a bandolier type thing for you know like cold kind of weather and stuff. And I've used it a few times and quite liked it. So it made me I made it made me like go and look at about in the in the Second World War they invented they had these like jackets that they had for D Day landings, which was a way of carrying a lot of gear, um, you know, rather than having webbing and all that kind of stuff. And so I was looking about. Th- that and you just end up going to all these different interesting areas about clothing and you know stuff you could you know try and make and uh, it's you know the idea of like making your own jeans you know once you once you make one pair that fit you you know you just keep making everything when they wear out just make another pair just buy a load of fabric and just keep make just keep making them it's kind of it's kind of cool you know make a pattern out of a piece of wood you know so so the wood's just you never you know it doesn't like get get flo- thrown away. So you got your patterns, and uh, you know it's quite, it's quite a, it's quite a good thing. You know, if you see, if you see something, often some, you see some something, and it looks, you know, it's like really specialized, but you realize it's actually quite easy, you know, easy to make. I'm gonna start making my own uh, carabiner soon. You know, I've got a, got a forge and everything. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, definitely, definitely check out Ray Jardine. Uh, and uh, a lot of there's a lot of good website. I've got a lot of good information about heavy duty sewing machines on sailing websites because a lot of people, a lot of sailors, have sewing machines uh, for for making sails, I guess. Um, and they they often use use the same kind of sewing machines, like these faff faff uh, sewing machines. Make sure it's German. Um, another question. Hi Andy, I've read uh, quite a few different articles from you. I really appreciate your work. You're welcome. I'll get straight to the point. Thank you. I've been climbing for quite a while. I've been rope soloing, rope solo climbing for some time. I adequately understand the dynamics of anchors, ropes, all the devices I own, including the potential failures of each of the pieces in the, of the system. I've used a Wild Country Revo quite a bit for my solo climbing. I typically use a backup knots. I also own a Grigri. Would you recommend using a Grigri over a Revo? I have used a Grigri once or twice, but I shy away from it simply because of the drag trying to pull the rope through the device. If so, why? I have only climbed well below my limit, so to prevent any need for really test my system. Because of that, I haven't taken any falls on either device. I know Joe Healy swears by his Maxim glider rope with an Edward Eddy. I am familiar with the Eddy, and I would frankly prefer to avoid another large purchase. Would you recommend? What would you recommend as an ideal setup? Given that I don't have a bottomless bucket of money or a silent partner. Thanks again. Appreciate work. Blah blah blah. That's from Tanner. So, um, I hope we haven't answered, and we haven't had, the, had that question already. But um, I get a, like a lot of questions about rope soloing, mainly because I wrote a book about rope soloing. And unfortunately, when I wrote the book about rope soloing. All the rope soloing devices in it were were stopped manu- they stopped manufacturing them literally the day the book came out. So, so the soloist, the silent partner, the soloed, all of them you can't buy them anymore. So that was a that's a pain. So it means that people who want to do like rope soloing, as in you start at the ground and you're climbing up, like lead lead rope soloing, have been left in the lurch really because the only thing that that worked really well was a silent partner, and the silent partner's what. Um, like Pete Whitaker used a silent partner when he soloed, sort of free, 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 free soloed. He so rope, free rope soloed L cap. Uh, you know, he used a silent partner. Um, so it's a really, really, really good device. Like it'd be interesting if you could get, 
you know, if you get like 2,000 people together, I wanted to buy one. And he went to Rock Exotica. We're like, look, I've got 2,000 people want to buy this thing. Can we buy, can we, uh, can you make 2,000 more if they would do it? Because I don't think it's about certification. Um, but, you know, I don't know if it's because the, it's obviously a device where people are really worried about being sued about, about it. Um, like I get, I get worried about writing a book about it because it's, you know, it's like I, I was a, I was a member of the rope soloing Facebook group, but it just terrified me so much. Some of the stuff that people were talking about that I had to leave because I thought it's like, you know, you got some moral responsibility to to you know to to tell people they're going to kill themselves. But after a while, you haven't got t- you haven't got the time. So, um, so you so people are now being left with using like uh some other kind of uh, um, uh, I call them ABBD, so it's an automatic assisted braking belay device, so a Grigri basically. Now, a, a, big, a big problem with drag with a lot of these devices is, so you've got the, like, and this is going to be boring for people who aren't interested in this kind of stuff, but basically you've got, on one side you've got like the, you've got the live rope, which is going down to the B layer. You know, you have a B layer at the bottom, you climb up. So the rope's attached to the B layer and it goes into your device. And as you climb, you're clipping the rope in, you're clipping your gear, you're clipping that live rope coming out of your Grigri or whatever into the gear. Then if you fall, the Grigri should lock you. So instead of having someone holding the Grigri at the bottom of the rope attached to you, no, yeah. Instead of having someone at the bottom of the rope with the Grigri and the rope's attached to you, the rope's attached to the bottom of the b and the Grigri is at your end, if that makes any sense, or the b device is at your end. So, you know, if you were, if you were good, you could just b with a with a, a normal b device, you know, with, a, with an ATC. And when you fell off, you just grabbed the rope. <laughs> but you'd have to be quite quick, uh, otherwise you'd die. So, so, so by having, like, a, an assisted b device, like a Grigri, then it means that, like, that, that should, exclamation marks, is exclamation marks those marks anyway speech marks what do they call them <laughs> exclamation marks um should should stop you but it's not guaranteed because that's not what it's designed for um there's like a lot of things that go wrong like you can cross load cross load the, the grigri cross load the carabiner um the grigri can get fouled up on something like a fifi hook can get can get caught inside the fifi inside the the thing and stop stop it from you know locking um there's like loads and loads of things that go wrong. So that's why if you're ever going to do it, A, I try, advise you to do it where you don't think you're going to fall off and B, always have a backup knot so you're clipped in with a, with a, you know, with a backup knot. So, the, so the, the big problem is is to do with the weight. So if you imagine like the, the, the device is like the, the what, what do you call it? The middle of like a, a, if it's like a pulley. Is it like a pulley? It's in the middle and you've got ropes on either side of it. You've got your, your live rope and your dead rope. Now, if 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 one rope gets too heavy, it'll start locking up the device, uh, or or where still the rope will start feeding through the device by itself, and it won't lock up. So, if say you're you're like forty meters above the ground, and you've got forty meters of rope below you, and you've got like ten meet, you know, twenty meters of rope on your side, and suddenly you can get this thing where the rope starts like creeping through, creeping through. You know, if, if you were if you were careful, the whole rope could like feed all the way through the device if you didn't have a backup knot. So you won't want that to happen. So, so generally, what you're trying to do is is avoid too much rope on either side, so, either either side. So when you're tying a backup knot, you're creating this loop of rope. So you never want the loop of rope, the backup, which is going from your device, a loop, and then to the backup knot, and then it, then the end of the knot goes down to the rest of the rope, which is either in a a rope bag or whatever. You never want that loop to be either too big or too small. If it's too small, uh, the 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 weight will be the weight. There's not enough weight to make it work properly. It's really hard to explain. You have to get the book. Uh, there's a photograph in it. Um, so you're trying to balance these two things. And another thing is like the diameter of the rope. You know, you're better with like a a thinner rope is going to move more easily. And if you have the B lid, if you have the gree gree sort of attached in a certain way like have it on like a sling uh so it's like held more upright then the, the rope will feed through a lot easier without jamming but then if you fall upside down uh you've got more risk of the um of it not locking up at all 
So it's 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 a really difficult. It's like I was, when I was talking about moving together on a on a snowy mountain. Like there isn't really a, there isn't really a safe option. Like a a silent partner was good because it would work in any direction. If you fell off, it would work upside down, sideways, whatever. Where a, a you know a Grigri style device doesn't doesn't work so well. Now the the Wild Country Revo works differently to all the other ones in that it's got more of it. It actually works more like a um, silent partner. And I expect like Pete bought a silent partner. So Pete Whitaker bought, I give Peter Whit- Whitaker a copy of my soloing book. And then that inspired Pete to get into rope soloing. And, and he bought like a silent partner where you can still buy them. Now Pete's sponsored by Wild Country. And I kind of suspect that Wild Country looked at the, looked at the silent partner and thought, oh, you could make like a belay device out of this. Um, so if it, if it works like, if it works like a silent partner, then, um, then it, it could, it could be quite good. Now, the only, the only problem, why the only reason I've never really said to use it is I am a little bit dubious about wild country, uh, the, <laughs> the last, the last few years. Um, I would, I would, I kind of wanted to see what happened to the Revo. Like if it, if it, you know, stood the test of time, you know, if, if it, if it, you know, if, if nothing, nothing bad came out of it, like, you know, like something, they all got recalled because they weren't working. Um, you know, I, was, I, I didn't want to ever say like, try it, try it. Uh, well, I can't say try it because it's, it's, uh, it's not designed for that. So if you're going to try using a Revo, you have to do it on your own, you know, on your own back really because it's uh you could kill yourself and uh with all the, with all this stuff the greek is the same it's not designed for that uh you can use it and lots of people do use it but it's not what it's not what petzl um recommend you use so it's it's kind of one of those it's it's one of those questions where um if you ask that if you if you have to ask the question then the answer is no and if you don't think if you don't think the answer no if you don't think no is the right answer then then I'd just do what you think. <laughs> Does that make sense? Do what you think. Um, because not none of it is like super, super safe. Uh, you've always, like when you like big wall climbing, it's not so bad. You know, you can get away with like a, a gree gree or whatever because you're going quite slowly. You can kind of feed the rope out yourself if, if, if need be. Um, you know, it's all, but like free climbing is a, is a lot, is a lot more difficult. It takes a lot more effort but it is it is possible. Like your man, I saw your man who, you know, who free rope soloed the nose. Um, I can't remember his name. Your Japanese man. Uh, you know, I, was, I kind of saw him there. We were having a conversation about rope soloing as he was like rope soloing up the nose. And he, you know, he used the Gree Gree and he obviously got it to work like amazingly well. So, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's loads of advantages. Like uh, Jean-Christophe Lafay used a Gree Gree uh, really, really, you know, very effectively on a lot of like really hard solos, and he used to use it with a very, you know, a, ro- a very thin rope, like a seven, seven and a half mil rope or something, uh, you know, which not is not designed for that kind of rope, but he, uh, so, you know, managed to get it to work. So it's one of those things. It's like, you know, it's like making your own, you know, jet, <laughs> you know, jet jet shoes or something. Um, you know, you you really need to know what the hell you're doing. Um, and if you're not if you're not sure what you're doing, then just try and do it. But just take you just be really really careful and just slowly find your way through it. Like I like a you know I've I've like I think I've taken like two falls like when I was rope soloing on a grigri, and one time uh, the grigri didn't lock for some reason, but I an ada was a clip to me. The ada clipped into a piece of gear, and that's what stopped me. And then another time I fell off. And I didn't think I did. I thought I was gonna. I didn't think I was gonna fall off, and it was a bit wet. Uh, and then, well, you know, next minute you're like, I think I had a really long rope. I, had, I think when I was gonna try and try to solo the the Harlan on the Iger, I was like practicing climbing on like a hundred meter rope, so I could like string like three pitches together with one rope. And I fell off on with with this like long rope, and I, I had so much stretch, you know, went like for miles for it. But but the, but the Gree Gree did actually work. Um, so yeah, the idea that you're not going to fall off is, uh, you know, it has to be it has to be like super easy, and there's always there's always that chance you you can fall off. It's all about I guess it's all about averages and stuff. So 
Um, so final final question, then you can all go you can all go home, you can put your chairs up and go home. Uh, I might have had this one already, so have a look. Uh, hi Andy, good to see the podcast developing. Uh, he's probably not listened to it very long. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on good climbing destinations to meet partners. I don't know if that's like sexual partners. Uh, good conditions at this time of year. Not sure when this was. I work in events which are suspended for the foreseeable. So a month long break in the uh, is on the cards. Um, uh, blah blah blah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, this was actually just at the beginning of the lockdown. This is actually a, an old an old an old email. Um, about places to go in the world, like rock climbing, where you've got good weather, you can meet people to go climbing. Uh, like I don't know if we could, I don't know if we're ever gonna, I don't know if we're ever gonna get, ever, ever be allowed to go or travel anymore. Only rich people will will be able to travel. Ex- as I expect. Um, I did see like I think all the rich people just wrote a letter saying, you know, we need to stop all the poor people from. Um, <laughs> from you know doing anything from now on because it's spoiling the world. Uh, I think it's those fucking assholes who spoiled it, not us. So um, yeah, I think I think my answer for for this was you know great places to go where you can guarantee you can go climbing. Uh, I hope we haven't answered this question before, but um, I think I said like Arapiles is a really good place in Australia and uh, Yosemite. Uh, there's probably there's probably other there's probably other places you could go, but they were like the the two I kind of think you're uh, you know there's places probably in like Mexico and um you know other places but other places you go like Red Rocks in Las Vegas is like absolutely a phenomenally amazing place to go rock climbing like absolutely amazing like if you're a British climber and you're used to cli- you're, you're used to like climbing in you know like adventurous places like it's really amazing absolutely amazing place to go climbing but it's not it's not so easy to just there's not so many people like hanging around where that where there is in places like Arapiles uh you know like like and the problem with like the Alps and places the same thing like the weather the weather never seems to be so good and people all you know are very transitory like everyone just leaves and goes somewhere else and um but but yeah, I I, th- I thought like Arapiles was like a really solid place to just like lots and lots of climbers all sitting around like you know a very casual climbing with each other and uh, the same with the same with Yosemite like less less so in Tuolumne uh, it's not it's just not the same in Tuolumne but very good very good place to go like if anybody if anyone's like you know gets made redundant and hasn't got you know doesn't got, they want. They just want to. Have you got enough money to just try and get somewhere uh, until things get better? Like Yosemite is probably a good place, <laughs> but if you're, not that you're allowed to leave. Like in the UK, it's like there isn't there isn't anywhere like that. I think. But I think it's kind of changing. Climbing has changed a lot. In that there's probably more places where people you'd go and there'd be like a lot of climbers who were just sort of hanging around for like months on end. But I don't think those days seem to exist anymore. I think people seem to have jobs and careers and 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 like real real lives and things to get on with. So I can't really th- can't really think of any, you know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So maybe maybe it's more fun if you if you got like a limited limited time. I went to this amazing place in Australia, um, uh, Munari, which is like you know really 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 beautiful, like like wild place but you know it's like in the outback but you know we were there for like maybe like a, a month or three weeks or something and i think we only ever saw like five people or something so uh you know uh, in rapalese there's just like tons and tons of people to go climbing with so yeah so i think uh yeah it's, 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 I'm, I'm sure he's i'm sure he's probably stuck like me he's probably in his house just thinking he'd like just to, to go to like scarborough somewhere or just go to Go to the end of the go to the three kilometers from his house, but you know, I think I'm going to buy. I think I'm going to get into sea kayaking. I think I think I'm going to explore the coast of Ireland. I think the I think I'm going to lower my lower my sights a little bit and just uh, you know you know lower my expectations. That's always that's always a good thing to do in life. Is like you know reduce your expectations of everything, and then you'll always you'll always be happy. So. That's the you know. So on that cheery note, I'll I shall I shall be doing 
you know, I wasn't going to do a talk this week on Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, Dublin time, um, which is probably the same as English time. But for some reason, all the English people turned up an hour late last time or the time before. So, um, yeah, I wasn't going to do it. But then a few people were like, oh, it's a like highlight of my week. So now I feel like I have to do it for those people. So I'm probably going to do about uh, skiing across Greenland. And I'm going to do, uh, it's kind of funny, funny story. Go across Greenland with someone in a wheelchair who can't walk. Lots of interesting, funny stories there. Um, people think it's really impressive if you go across Greenland, you know, if you're paralyzed, paraplegic, but, you know, you're sitting down the whole way. What is it, you know, how hard can it be? So, um, and, uh, and yes, yeah, so, and uh, maybe, maybe the week after that, I might do, I might do, I've got a talk I'd do about uh, soloing. Um, which talks about soloing that like, sea of dreams and all those kind of all that kind of good stuff. So um, yeah, and I'll try and I'll do I'll try and do another. I'm going to do another podcast where I'm interviewing someone. I hope people. I don't I don't know if that one with Pete was good or not because I don't like listening to these things after they're done. But I've had some good some nice people said some nice things about it. So, but I'm just waiting to get some more wires for my computer so I can try and make it sound uh, less crap. So yeah. So anyway, so if you like this podcast, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff and uh, press like, ring the bell, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And I shall speak to you soon. Mm-hmm.